Welcome again. My name is Ethan Vesley Flad, um, interim co-executive director of the Fellowship of Reconciliation, joining you from Asheville, North Carolina, Cherokee land. Thank you for joining me today for just a wonderful conversation with someone who I can't wait to meet now. Um, uh, at least I got you to laugh there, Rima. Um, my beloved spouse, Rima Vesley Flad, um, PhD. Uh, who is the author of the new book that has just come out this week, Black Buddhists and the Black Radical Tradition, The Practice of Stillness and the Movement for Liberation. Um, it's really, uh, I think, pretty special to host this on this date um, as it is um, recognized uh, in some ways as the birth date of the Buddha. Um, and... So it's a, a moment when we can honor this tradition and recognize this. And Rima, I wonder if you would lead us as we start our program today in this conversation and sacred circle in a moment of grounding and meditation. Absolutely. It's so nice to see faces, faces I haven't seen for quite some time in many cases. And um, long-term friends and family. Thank you and welcome. We'll just take a few minutes to ground ourselves in our body before beginning our conversation. So I invite you all to either sit or stand, or if you prefer to walk or even lie down, to be in a position that is relaxing for you. Just take a moment to do so. And as you move into a grounding position, if you're sitting, I invite you to either put your feet flat on the floor or if you're sitting cross-legged to um, put your knees and maybe your hands on your knees whatever feels balancing and also that your posture can be upright and alert, or if you're laying down, just very, very settled. And as you attune to your body, I invite you to be conscious of your breath in some place in your body so maybe that is in your belly and you can start to be conscious of the rise and the fall of your belly. Some people pay attention in their nostrils and being conscious of the in and out of your breath in your nostrils. Whatever feels right to you, just take a few moments to breathe slowly. And as you are breathing at your own pace, I 
now invite you to come back to our virtual space. You can go slow, there's no rush. And if you feel comfortable, feel free to turn on your camera or not, if you prefer to leave it off. Either is fine. Thank you, Rima. And thank you all once again for coming together for this conversation together and this opportunity to learn about this book and about our own stories and an opportunity to talk with Rima about this, this journey that led to this text and um, the work we do together. Um, Rima, I wonder if you would share a little bit with this circle about um, your personal story that led to the creation of this project. Um, and I say that in the context of when you were young, um, you were an evangelical Christian. And later on, you ended up going to a Christian seminary, uh, got an MDiv, um, and you were invited into a, an ordination process in a Christian tradition. And ultimately, you became a Buddhist practitioner that then later on led you to this, um, this project. So would you share a bit of that story that led to this, this amazing book? Sure. It's kind of interesting to actually bring in my seminary background and my time in the church, because I write a little bit about my personal experience in the introduction of this book. And I don't talk about that at all. And it wasn't that present for me until Ethan and I started preparing for this conversation today. But, um, but yes, I, I was raised in a non-denominational tradition. I found it very, very oppressive and uh, veered towards Marxism at the age of 19. I started traveling around the world um, I do think my studies of Marxism and my time in South Africa in particular led me to embrace the Black Radical Congress, which I worked for in my early 20s while I was at seminary, while I was a student studying liberation theology. For me, liberation theology and the study of Marxism and Black radicalism were all very interlinked. But it is true that I also really veered towards contemplative practices and for a long time, I actually did not know where to find those outside of the Episcopal Church, and specifically the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in the center of Manhattan, which was for me this incredible sanctuary. And, you know, Manhattan is loud and it's full of concrete, and I found the cathedral to be just this incredibly beautiful, quiet place of refuge. And so it made sense then that I would be um, interested in the Episcopal Church. I was pursued by the Diocese of Los Angeles. And yet when I actually tried ordination, I just fell apart. I really uh, was a very self-silencing individual in that particular institution. I um, could not hear myself and I was, I would say, really paralyzed in, in many ways. And so eventually, and this is, of course, when we began our relationship, which led to this now, what, 20 years together, um, eventually we moved back to New York. And I, it was, it was right at that time that I started to look for opportunities to practice Buddhism. And it was kind of piecemeal initially. And uh, I went to a monastery in the tradition of Thich Nhat Hanh, and they taught me how to meditate. I had never really been trained. Um, I eventually found a Zen center in Brooklyn that did prison work. And I was at the time doing 
work related to mass incarceration and re-entry of people with felony convictions. And so I was interested in them politically and yet um, mostly interested in trying to figure out how to turn towards the intensity of my mind. I would say that I was really suffering deeply with um, feelings of uh, inadequacy and inferiority and that it was very hard. It took two years to really learn how to meditate. And I would even go for these 10 hour sits called Zazenkai, just sit and sit and sit and feel um, really just, I would say quite low. But I, I could see around me, maybe it was the energy of people in that space or the image I had of people who were internally stable, but I stuck with it. And so after that two years, I was able finally to, I would say, really practice. And when I say practice, I mean that practice of just being present with whatever comes up without crumbling in the face of it. And, you know, we talk a lot in meditation about non-judgment and and it is that it's whatever comes up is there and being able to welcome and meet that regardless of how hard it feels. So that practice, I would say, saved my life and um, in many ways was a way forward, even though I was doing this very political work. I was at that time working with people who had uh, felony convictions, doing lots of organizing work, doing lots of advocacy, especially legislative advocacy. But really the foundation of that work was this practice of silence and non-judgment. And I eventually shifted to the insight tradition and that's where I still am. And it's in large part because there was a direct welcoming and orientation and support for people of color. Um, for example, Insight Meditation Society in Massachusetts was busing people from New York City to IMS, to their center and and giving full scholarships for retreats. And so I was able to go and sit and work with amazing teachers, many of whom are quoted in this book, this um, book, which I would say is such a work of love. It's really an honoring of those teachers. And that was essential. that was almost 20 years ago. So uh, it's been quite a journey since. I think in my own experience, it's not an either or. It's not that you do political work or you do grassroots work or movement work or you sit and you meditate, but rather you provide some kind of foundation for yourself and for your community so that you can really be a self-contained person and work with whatever reactivity arises and bring that into movement work directly. And that's really what this book is um, offering, is that kind of both and approach. Thank you for that just piece of your path that brought you here and, and also for naming as you came into your Buddhist practice, um, that distinction as you first sat in a, in a center uh, that was in a particular Zen tradition and then moved into the insight tradition. And I wonder if you'd say a little bit about then um, Buddhism in this country and uh, give a, us a bit of a framing for, again, what makes then this, this book um, really distinct in terms of talking about um, peoples of African descent and uh, Buddhist practice and maybe what has made that distinct from other ways that Buddhism has been uh, either been experienced or been perceived. Um, in the West? Well, in many ways, I think this book, I'll use the term one of my mentors uses, this book is a disruption. I, I offered uh, the language of extension. This, this book extends the concept of American Buddhism, which is so in this country associated with whiteness and is very white dominated in terms of who runs the prominent institutions, the public think houses, the magazines, et cetera, et cetera. But my mentor, Dr. Tracy Hux, 
when she uh, was offering feedback on the book, said this book really actually disrupts our concepts of American Buddhism. And I appreciate that language because what it really does is say, yes, there are forms of Buddhism. There are many forms. And I think something we have to contend with in this country is the erasure of Asian and Asian American forms of Buddhism, which are how we are able to enter these lineages and practice with them and access these teachings. And yet so often it, um, the traditions, the, the sanghas that are founded and attended by Asian and Asian American Buddhists are uh, peripheral to what we conceptualize as American Buddhism. So that is deeply problematic. And I think there's some recognition slowly emerging in the same way that there's a recognition that people of African descent as well bring traditions into what we call American Buddhism that are very distinct from what uh, you could say is the dominant norm. So the, so uh, just in broad strokes, there are three main lineages historically within Buddhism. There is the Theravada tradition, which is the tradition of Southeast Asia. That is the tradition of Sri Lanka, Burma, Thailand. And I named that because uh, the insight tradition in this country finds its roots in the Theravada tradition. So it's just important to recognize that because many of the teachers who are still alive and teaching went to those countries in their 20s. They learned to meditate from those from uh, particular teachers, specifically in Thailand and Burma, and they brought the teachings back and founded centers like IMS. Uh, there is also the Mahayana tradition, and that is where we find Zen, the roots of what we call American Zen. And American Zen have many, many different ways of appearing and practices and rituals. Um, but what's interesting is that primarily Zen teachers um, who are primarily uh, white and well-educated uh, practiced and found those teachers here in the United States um, there are some very, very famous Japanese teachers in particular who were planted in California and were, uh, you could say, gurus for then American Zen teachers. And a lot of the most prominent Zen centers arose from those traditions. But what's important is that while the founding teachers were, say, Japanese or Korean, the... Um, evolution of those centers was very much predominantly white and, and continued to be led by white teachers. And then there's the kind of third iteration, which is Vajrayana or Tibetan Buddhism. And in a similar vein, the teachers um, within the Tibetan lineage came to the United States and founded centers and many of their disciples who are usually white Americans in some cases perhaps Canadian, um, took over the running of those centers so that what is known as American Buddhism has, even if its origins were explicitly um, in Asian traditions and from Asian teachers, they were they evolved in such a way that they are very much part of, you could say, white culture. And the way that appears primarily is in a very kind of solitary orientation towards meditation that is often stripped of the uh, ritual practices that say honor ancestors or um, the languages, frankly. Sometimes uh, some of the chants are still in the original languages, but often the chants aren't really brought into some of these sanghas. It really depends on the tradition. That's not a blanket statement, but it is to say that when people of African descent have entered these spaces, they've often found themselves to be very isolated and there is not the sense of community that they may have maybe experienced in churches. Many Black Buddhists come from church traditions. Many of them are still part of church traditions, but they are seeking practices that really help to settle their minds and their hearts. They're seeking new ways to work with suffering 
many of them, even if they still identify as Christian, have been really harmed in churches and maybe seeking other spiritual communities. And, you know, similar to thinking about Black activism, radical politics, and Buddhism, it's not so much an either or as much as it's trying to orient and live into another way of being, one that is more settled. Um, you could say giving oneself permission to feel hard feelings and finding skillful ways to work with those feelings. So a lot of Black Buddhists find their way into Buddhism for those reasons and yet can feel very, very alienated in predominantly white spaces. And so this book in some ways, and again, using that word disruption, this, this book disrupts the idea that Buddhism is in this country associated with whiteness. And it also introduces these other ways of entering into these practices and evolving them in such a way that it's uh, that the tradition and that the practices and teachings are deeply meaningful for the particular experiences of people of African descent. So I can actually tell you, maybe this is a good time, I can tell you um, a little bit about the, the findings, or maybe that's one of your questions. But, um, you know, I went into this book project asking questions about how this is relevant, how these teachings are relevant to vanguard activists in Ferguson. And I was interested in how kind of obscure teachings like no self are relevant to people who have been told that historically their ancestors were three fifths of a human being. How do you recognize or how do you internalize teachings such as no self? And so I was interested in, I would say very uh, particular points, not broad, but also uh, not not completely encompassing the breadth of why people practice, why um, Black people become teachers, why they sit in monasteries, and you know why they choose this journey. And the first finding, I would say, which was spontaneously mentioned in more than half of my interviews, is that practicing Buddhism is a way to heal intergenerational trauma. And actually, I developed a whole chapter with regards to that. And there's a quote I want to read. I was just looking for this. Um, this is by Conda Mason. And this just, I, I think this, um, this is in the chapter on, on intergenerational trauma. And I think this is a very poignant quote. She says, when I think about where Black women are right now, and I think about the Black Lives Matter movement, which is run by Black women, Black women are showing up in this time and place in deep leadership. We lost our children when our children got taken away and sold. I think we're still finding our children. I think we're still looking for each other. And I think that the pain that Black women have suffered, Black men have suffered as well, but that particular pain is catalytic to the healing now that I find Black women leading on a political level on an interpersonal level, on a community level, on a society level. She says, that's where the wisdom is coming from. And I thought that was just such an important and just very graphic way of saying, this is the work we're doing. And, and this is some of what our healing is about. You know, our families were separated on the auction block and we still faced incredible suffering within our families and so so that was one finding and it really arose spontaneously and another finding was some of what i just mentioned with regards to honoring ancestors you know black folk having been so separated intergenerationally do honor our ancestors in a way that you don't necessarily find in traditionally white sanghas and communities. There is the sense of standing on the shoulders of people who have made a way out of no way. And that comes up over and over. I think in our church communities, there is a sense of lineage, but in white sanghas, there isn't necessarily that sense that I wouldn't be here if my ancestors had not struggled to survive and created these opportunities. 
So there is an honoring of ancestors really in a very different way than I think are found in white sanghas in, I would say, across lineages. And there are some really beautiful quotes in this book about that and about what that means in particular. And then the third finding is something that I didn't necessarily have language around, but is um, so poignant, which is this, and it's, it's, really, it's part of this exercise we just did, this very brief meditation, which is that we become free when we can tap into our bodies. But if we stay in our heads, we stay in this sense, in this kind of chaos. And even if our minds settle, if we are just focused on our minds without tapping into our bodies, we are still in this mode of disconnection. When I say free, I don't necessarily mean in a political sense as much as coming to the rhythms of the body and being able to tap into those more settled energies, like following the breath is a practice of liberation. There's real language and experience of that. And yet when you have come of age, when your ancestors have come of age in a country that has defiled, that has rejected Blackness, it's so easy to in turn internalize that, um, that rejection, that self-rejection. And so much of what I heard was that this body, which has been so rejected in a white supremacist culture, is actually this vehicle for liberation. And that really coming into these practices is inevitably coming to embrace Blackness, not in a kind of hierarchical way, as much as this body is the body that allows us to move towards freedom in an internal way. So there is that sense of um, this historically rejected vehicle is actually the vehicle towards freedom. And there's something I think quite beautiful in that. And one thing I heard many people talk about was the importance of dancing the importance of bowing and um, engaging in embodied rituals. And, and yes, just the sense of being deeply settled in the, the movement of the breath. So all of that led to this final conclusion in my own study of Black radicalism, which is that there's actually also a precedent within the Black radical tradition that says psychological freedom and independence from whiteness is central to the Black radical tradition. And one thing I find in my research and all of these interviews is that there actually is a way of becoming independent psychologically from the dominant narratives of white supremacy through these practices. And I saw so many of these teachers and these long-term practitioners really embody that. And the way that I talk about it and think about it is that there is a way of entering into deep practice so that we're no longer in a state of reactivity, but rather in a state of stillness. And in that state of non-reactivity, then whiteness is no longer something we're always pushing against, but it's just there. And frankly, in Buddhism, it's considered impermanent and there's nothing solid about it. So there's nothing that we need to so deeply engage if we can move to this place of non-reactivity and stillness. It doesn't have to be so oppressive. Wow, you've given us so much there, Rima. Thank you um, in terms of just these different pieces that really opened up for you in the creation of this book and in the conversations that you held. And um, I mean, I think we can talk, uh, we could talk kind of chapter by chapter if we wanted through all the different pieces in terms of the um, intergenerational uh, components of um, generations and centuries of anti-Blackness and white supremacy and what that, how that was expressed and all that. I think I want to pick up maybe on uh, where you were just kind of finishing in terms of those three pieces that really emerged for you in this process and um, uh, the, the embodiment, but, but as it connected to psychological, uh, as it connects to psychological liberation and freedom. And I think um, someone picking up maybe a book about Buddhism wouldn't expect to find uh, references to when quotes from 
Marcus Garvey and Asata Shakur and um, Angela Davis and Malcolm X and Huey Newton and Bobby Seale and, and so forth. Um, you know, maybe, I mean, you draw also, of course, upon the extraordinary writings and teachings of Bell Hooks and Alice Walker and Audre Lorde and James Baldwin, but those radical thinkers, but you tie all of them and, and Martin himself, uh, whose memory we rec- remember this week, um, uh, in terms of that piece of, uh, of, the, of the liberation of Black people and the coming and the, the core consciousness. Um, and uh, I wonder if you would talk about those pieces, again, as somebody who worked, as you said, um, for the Black Radical Congress at the same time you were uh, doing a a divinity degree and, and so forth, um, that interlacing of these movements for uh, radical empowerment and um, uplift uh, with um, uh, spiritual um, uh, tradition and enlightenment. Can you share more about that? Yeah, I thank you for that question. I say at the outset, I do not mean to suggest that liberation in the Buddhist tradition and liberation in the Black radical tradition mean exactly the same thing. And in the introduction, I spend a lot of time actually mapping out some of the very, very obvious and core differences in terms of what liberation suggests and what is assumed in these two, you could say, very different, not oppositional, but very different traditions. But I do think, and I do make this argument in a kind of academic way, that there is overlap between the spiritual tradition of Buddhism and the emphasis on psychological liberation in the Black radical tradition, that there is overlap with regards to psychological liberation um, and, and specifically what that term means. And so that's really where I go. And I make this distinction. Sometimes I put them all together, but I use this phrase, there's spiritual, psychological, and political liberation. But I also want to break those apart and emphasize that those are also distinct. But through this practice of Buddhism, you don't necessarily need to have certain beliefs to practice. So Even what I was saying with regards to non-self, you can take um, this explanation of the human being as, you could say, unstable, impermanent, uh, always shifting, always changing, this teaching on non-self. You can take that and you can accept that, or you can reject that teaching and still practice, still practice meditation. And in this practice of of um, seeing what arises and falls without judgment, just seeing impermanence all around you, even within your own person, you can still do that and settle your mind and start to see more clearly. And I do argue that in that practice, and, and this is partly from personal experience and partly from all of these interviews, in that practice, there is this way then to live into non-reactivity. The reason I think this is such a powerful teaching that links to the Black radical tradition and why I think people like Malcolm and Baldwin and MLK and yes, Marcus Garvey, uh, people within you know the, the kind of standing or pro- most prominent writers in the Black feminist tradition, even the teachings of the Black church tradition or the Black prophetic tradition, the reason I think there's congruence is because in all of these traditions, there is such an emphasis and all of these writers publish on this emphasis of of being um, liberated from white dominant narratives, the ones that we come of age hearing, seeing, internalizing, all of these traditions emphasize how destructive that is for people of African descent. And so the the practice of, you could say meditation, I would say Buddhism because we are given specific teachings, but all of that I say actually leads into a kind of fulfilling of the how-to, how do you actually then divest yourself of these 
uh, extremely toxic, extremely dominant narratives. And I do think, and, and then you have people like Bell Hooks and Alice Walker really announcing these in very clear ways. I do think that there are patterns and practices within the Black radical tradition that, um, and within Buddhism in particular, that foster that kind of independence of mind or healing. Maybe those two terms are interchangeable in what I'm getting at. But in my mind, you know, people like Malcolm, Malcolm's autobiography, his speeches, more than talking about you know, uh, independent businesses or political independence from white representatives, more than anything, he talked about liberating Black minds from the toxicity of white supremacy. We see this in MLK's speeches as well. You know, why, why we can't wait? Why, why now? Why the fierce urgency of now? It's because Black children are coming of age in this country, looking at themselves through the eyes of white people. For, Mal for Martin Luther King, for Malcolm, for both of them, the central message is how do we allow our children the full liberatory spirit that is accessible to them, but not if they continue to grow up in segregation, whether legal or de facto. So yes, there is a fierce urgency of now, and they talked about it because they were primarily, not exclusively, but primarily concerned with what white supremacy does to Black people's minds and mental health and spirits. They were deeply spiritual people. I would actually argue that they were all deeply spiritual people on some level, but I don't want to put that necessarily upon every, every Black radical writer. But to me, they, that emphasis um, was so cogent and so apparent that it is worth highlighting even as we work towards political freedom. And actually on that note, this is important to name explicitly that I very much honor vanguard activists and have often when capable, when I have capacity also put myself out there. And I do think it is important that we don't give all of ourselves away, that we actually take time for healing within our communities, within our persons, that we're not only turning our energy outward towards dismantling power structures, but that actually we do concentrate on the internal work and specifically that work of healing. Would you, um, I, I, I wanna invite this wonderful community of folks into the conversation as well in the next few minutes in case any of you have some questions you want to ask Rima about this book and uh, what she's sharing with us. So let me maybe bring in uh, one or two more uh, questions and then see who would like to ask something. I know a few of you have already gotten the book uh, in, in these first few days since it's pu been published. Um, you were just speaking again about the liberation of the mind and the spirit, and you, you talked earlier about um, uh, the body and embodiment, and you shared a bit about some of the different practices uh, that uh, are reflected in uh, Black um, Buddhist spaces and sanghas, um, dancing and um, drumming and uh, storytelling and chanting. So um, I, I wonder if you'd share a little bit more about that and the, the, um, in the context of embodiment, and then also lead that maybe into uh, talking a little bit about the chapter that talks about um, embodiment in the context of particularly the work of Audre Lorde and James Baldwin and the sensuality uh, that you discuss uh, um, uh, in the context of, a, of the body in that chapter. So I, I think it's all intertwined. And I really say that not because of my own assessment, but because of uh, what my interviewees have put forth. And, you know, this sense, and actually I'm going to quote someone who's both a dear friend and a very trusted mentor. Her name is Sabine Selassie. I have learned so much from Seb. And, and Seb actually has her own book, so I'll just um, put that out there. It's called You Belong. And what someone like Seb, and she's not alone, would say is that 
in this practice of psychological liberation, we are actually practicing coming back to our bodies and freeing our bodies. And in her book, You Belong, as well as in several interviews, and I've quoted some of her Dharma talks as well, Seb will say, for example, uh, that it's so deeply important to actually tap into the energies of the body in this practice of psychological liberation and not just through breathing, but yes, through dancing and, and you know, finding a kind of um, freedom, for lack of a better word, and just being uninhibited. And part of that, that lack of inhibition then does veer into being very present with sensual or erotic energies. And Seb is one person, there are many others um, thinking of, oh, people like Leslie Booker. Actually, if you go to my website and you go to the resources page, many of them are listed with their own websites and you can find them and um, look into what they're about. But these are folks who will say, and who do say that it's so important to tap into a kind of sensual or erotic energy that's not so much sexual. That's not what they're talking about. It's more the sense of tapping into life-giving energy or regenerative energy, a kind of energy that is um, uh, spontaneous, that veers towards uh, bringing forth that which you love, that sense of being in love, um, that sense of joy. You know, sometimes you hear this phrase, black joy is black resistance. And that's really what they're getting at. And many of them are indebted to the works of James Baldwin and Audre Lorde because both Baldwin and Lorde were people who looked at this dominant society and said, this is a very sexually repressed society. And it's not so much that we're advocating for a kind of sexual uh, licensure. That's not what they were saying. They were saying, actually, if we weren't so repressed, we could start to work with the fear that leads to this repression. And if we can work with that fear, we could actually enter it. And if we could dismantle it, we could undo white supremacy. We could undo patriarchy and homophobia. What they were really about was naming this kind of paralyzing repressive fear that perpetuated whiteness and actually led, continues to, this isn't even past tense, but leads white people to so much repress their own energies, their sensual energies, that they project everything they can't deal with onto Black people. And both Baldwin and Lord talked about this. Baldwin, actually, in many interviews would say things like, you know, that's how we got an N-I-G-G-E-R, the construct. He'd say, that's not me. I'm a Black man. But this is why white people need this. Is they're so repressed. And so Baldwin would say, like, actually, if we could just move into this kind of energy of spontaneity and love, we could break bread together and we're just breaking bread and it's not socially laden and it doesn't mean everything that we put on it. It's just this act of being together. They had so much passion for this way of relating to other people. And so they have actually very much inspired and influenced Black Buddhists who similarly are seeking to, you could say, uh, disrobe the shroud of white supremacy, which is in tandem with patriarchy, with the heaviness of homophobia, that it's it's very interconnected. And I think it's not um, it's not an anomaly that at least half, and I think actually more than half of my interviewees self-identify as LGBTQIA somewhere um, in that spectrum. And in addition to the 40 interviews I included, I included the voices of 31 additional Black Buddhist teachers, and they too are uh, people who identify outside of the heteronormative norms. And I think that's important to name because it suggests a willingness to go against the dominant norms and to embrace or to live into these erotic or sensual energies which again are not explicitly linked to sexuality as much as linked to a kind of life-giving force. That's really what it's about. 
Would you also say maybe a little something about, um, I mean, you, you spoke earlier to, you know, again, your own um, path in terms of a couple of Buddhist uh, lineages, and you, you talked broadly about Buddhism in terms of its uh, three antecedents. There, in terms of all the, the Buddhist lineages that are expressed in this country, and there are many diverse ones, um, the, the interviews that you did um, went across a number of these different traditions. Some of the uh, teachers are identified with more than one tradition, um, but there were, um, I think, a couple of the traditions w where um, Black Buddhists, Buddhists of African descent are particularly, uh, there's a much higher percentage or um, a number of them that are seen in those traditions and why that, why that may have been over the course of the last uh, several decades. Yeah, that's a great question. So it is a uh, multi-lineage in terms of who I sought out. I would say it, um, because so many of the ways in which I was able to access interviewees was through word of mouth, that it is um, in, uh, dominated, that's, that's just not the right word, but it is majority, I'll say it that way, um, people within the insight tradition, that's also because of the ways in which teacher trainings have happened. And insight is not um, led by gurus necessarily, it's led by lay teachers. And so there are just different structures in place. And some of the other lineages, really one teacher ordains the next teacher. And so there's a different process in place. Um, and the numbers are much smaller. This is true in both Soto and Rinzai Zen communities. It's also true in, for example, the Shambhala tradition, which is one lineage within uh, Tibetan Buddhism. So it is to say that, yes, the numbers are quite skewed. And I will say, and this is my own self-criticism, that uh, something I think the book lacks is adequate representation from Soka Kakai International, which is actually the lineage. It's uh, based in Japan, but it has the most, in terms of sheer numbers, the most numbers of both Black and Latinx participants or adherents uh, within that tradition, it's a lay-based tradition. There are actually no teachers within SGI. And I would say I'm not well-connected within SGI circles. The vast majority of my interviewees are identified not only themselves, but also by institutions as teachers. And so it would be somewhat of a different project, although not a completely different project to have tried to figure out the landscape of SGI in this country, and I didn't do that. But I think it is worth noting that just in terms of sheer numbers, that is a tradition that has the most Buddhist adherents that are both um, Black identified and Latinx identified. So I would say the book is very profound. I was very inspired in this five-year project, and it has some gaping holes, and that to me is one of them. But uh, I do attempt to um, represent across lineages as I was able to. And in the process of researching, actually did four rounds of interviews and tried to continue to follow leads and then to read as much as possible Dharma talks, some of which I transcribed, um, some of which I uh, found printed, also blog entries, um, articles and magazines, books, edited volumes, personal narratives. So I did my best to try to read and um, quote across across lineages. Over the course of the four to five years that, it, I mean, you started writing this in 2017, I think it was, and doing oh, interviews. <laughs> uh, um, so almost exactly five years now uh, to, to publication. Um, what, a, what a project. You attended, and I think you mentioned earlier, uh, both of the two extraordinary gatherings of um, Black Buddhist teachers and long-term time practitioners. One, uh, the first one at Union Theological Seminary in the fall of um, 2018, and then a year later at, at the Spirit Rock Meditation Center. And you, you flew back 
uh, to the U.S. from when we were living in Ghana uh, that year to attend that um, gathering of uh, almost, uh, I think it was close to 100 people who came together, you know, something between 70 and 100, and quite an extraordinary gathering of across many lineages and, and so forth. And um, uh, I wonder if you would share maybe a little bit um, and again, I want to make sure I invite everyone, if you have a question or a comment, you can put that into the chat um, for Rima and myself to offer, or you can use the hand function, which is in the reactions area, to put up your hand to ask a question. We'd love to welcome your voice. Um, but you write, uh, Rima, about some of the specific teachings um, that really uh, you, you see in terms of the direct connection uh, or, or how they are applied maybe in terms of Black Buddhist communities. Um, and uh, in addition to, you, you've talked earlier about non-self and self, but would you talk a little bit more about some of those teachings and maybe how you really uh, understood them in terms of right action and, um, and uh, suffering and cultivating presence and inner spaciousness um, uh, uh, offer us a bit of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, it would be great to, to give you a quote. And the quote that comes to mind is actually one by Ruth King. Although here's a great quote from Seb as well. And there's another great quote by Lama Rod Owens, who also has some published writings. There are some really great quotes in this book. I think I love this book most because I was able to to bring these voices um, together in such a direct way. That and the footnotes. Yes, and I buy books for footnotes, or in this case, endnotes. But yeah, so actually, I'm on page 174. This is what the book looks like. Gus had, Gus had asked. Let me see if I'm doing this correctly. There we go. Um, so... Yeah, this is Sebene, and this is Sebene talking about non-self. She says, the Buddha was asked if there was a self or non-self. He wouldn't answer because he said that's not the right question. He pointed to the functional need for connecting or relating to the self. It's not like he walked around and didn't refer to himself or didn't have reference for others. He said, those are necessary designations we need to move through the world. There is self, but there's also non-self. He wasn't saying that non-self is someplace we have to get to, and then we can let go of self. He was pointing out that we must develop an understanding of non-self. This is a mark of existence too, in the same way that suffering is a mark of existence. But he also said there's freedom from suffering. I think that's a really beautiful quote because Seb and Lama Rad, who's in the Kayugu tri uh, Tibetan tradition, also says, you know, it's not so much that it's one or the other, it's the way we understand them in relation to each other. And in this case, I'm thinking of Lama Rod talking about ultimate freedom. There's a, a teaching called Two Truths. There's relative freedom, and that bears on the reality around us, the phenomenal world. And then there's ultimate freedom. And Lama Rod will say, really, we have to actually live our lives in order to access ultimate freedom. We have to work with what we have. I'm also thinking of Zenju, um, Zenju uh, who is in the Soto Zen tradition. So these, again, these are teachers in three different lineages. And Zenju would say, actually, our work is to... Uh, to embody and to delve into our own experiences, our direct experiences, our experiences of daily life. And in so doing, that is how we access ultimate reality or ultimate freedom. They all, because these teachings transcend uh, the particular cultural iterations, they are all talking about the fact that really our work is to delve deeply into our own lives. And in so doing and in developing practices to really come face to face with our own experiences, our own suffering, that then is how we access the freedom the Buddha has articulated and that the Buddha's descendants have articulated. But first we go into our own experiences and we face them 
and we develop, you could say, the muscles to really confront what's going on. So for example, the fear I talked about that's so embedded in white supremacy, what if we turned to that and really worked with that and were able to get beneath that, both for those of us who have internalized that and those of us who continue to perpetuate that? What if we could really turn to those experiences? It's in working directly with those energies that we can then access what uh, sometimes gets translated as ultimate reality. I see there's a wonderful, yeah, a quote here that I think just flows so amazingly from what you were just sharing, Rima. Um, it's from Dr. Dr. Gwendolyn Zahara Simmons. Um, Assalamu alaikum, um, Zahara and Ramadan Karim. Um, uh, Zahara asks, given this destruction of so many of our black and brown children in our public school system, how can Buddhist practice be used to help these children? That really seems to... Uh, evoke what you were just talking about in terms of the the, the trauma and the suffering. Um, what would you say? I think uh, to use the term Buddhism in public schools might raise flags, but there is absolutely a movement that's called mindfulness meditation that is uh, adapted, you could say, and is not maybe as um, triggering in particular communities. But I, I think that actually that question can be answered in two ways and that it's both a practice and that there that is happening in public schools in different parts of the country. I mean, I could actually think of a number of organizations that have explicitly fostered these practices of, of watching whatever arises, watching thoughts without judgment, working with the breath and settling the mind. The other thing that I think is so important about what I'll now say is Buddhist practice is this framing of everything being impermanent or unsubstantial, that um, there is a kind of uh, shifting to all aspects of life. And I do think if we can teach children to be aware of that, actually in uh personal experiences that are particularly painful, there's a sense that this now, but not always, that this will change inevitably because change is inevitable and that's so central to Buddhist teachings. And I also think it helps black and brown children explicitly to say, yes, we have the system of white supremacy and yes, it has shaped our lives in these indelible ways. And there's something unsubstantial that can't be substantiated. There's something that um, is hollow or shifting. It's not permanent and it's not true. There isn't an inherent solid truth to this idea that white people are smarter or more beautiful or more sophisticated or more capable or more uh, physically adept. It's simply not true. It's a construct. And I think if we can take the inherent teachings of Buddhism and impermanence and the sense of, and the teaching of constant change, we can actually start to deconstruct these truths that we take to be so permanent and so solid and to say, actually, they're not permanent and they're not solid. They're simply a construct in a way of understanding that white people have found useful for them, but that doesn't serve me and in fact is really damaging. So in that way, I think there's something really profound within Buddhism that can help children to say, okay, this is what we've been given, but actually we can see the hollowness and how, um, how lacking, how uh, frail it is. Actually, it is quite frail if we're willing to take it on its own terms and deconstruct it. Thank you. Um, we have another um, lovely, wonderful question here from Shiva, our good friend, brother, and writing from Accra, who asks if there was a particular moment for you that made you feel like the stories in this book had to be told. I mean, you've, you've referenced kind of the path that led you into this project broadly. Was there 
was there something, uh, a, a special moment, and I think you write in the introduction, and you referenced this briefly earlier, um, about the time, time that we were together in Ferguson. We went twice together during the context of the uh, Ferguson movement, um, uh, initially uh, in late November of 2014, and then again at the end of December and early January. And, and you write in the introduction, and I don't know that this is it, but uh, I do. it does strike me that the way you talk about it in the introduction um, about, again, the extraordinary young uh, organizers who are at the heart of that movement and the distinction this, uh, that there was at, uh, for them. And, and at this point, you are... Um, working on your project of your previous book, um, Racial Purity and Dangerous Bodies, and really looking at the, the uh, centuries of, of intergenerational trauma and uh, uh, the legacies of, 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 of that, that that led into that project around mass incarceration and, and, and the body. Um, but you talked about how these young organizers were really seeing themselves as separate from traditional religion and you could say the black church maybe particularly, but um, was that a, a, a particular tipping point for you in terms of thinking about this project or was there something else that you would uh, lift up in that way? I would say that that is when I started wondering if it was, it was in Ferguson, uh, when I started to wonder if Buddhism would be uh, a salient or a welcome uh, set of teachings and practices. We don't have such strong institutions, Buddhist institutions, for example, in the way that the church for centuries has been um, so accessible in this country. But, but part of the reason I was wondering is that yes, these young people felt very disaffected, particularly from black churches a lot of that had to do with the fact that many of them are uh, queer, self-identify as queer, many are non-binary uh, or transgender, and they felt because of homophobia in uh, many Black churches, not, I wouldn't say all of them, but the vast majority, they felt that they were not welcome, that they were not supported, and that they could not actually um, root this particular movement in the Black church as the civil rights movement had been rooted in the Black church. And so that was some of what I thought about. There is, I'm going to say this language of movement somewhat loosely. So um, maybe a framework, maybe that language is better. There is a framework called healing justice. And I actually think that language is really beautiful. And I do think many, many of these activists embrace that framework. And it really has to do with self-care. There's lots of meditation and yoga and other forms of, you could say, spiritual wellness that are integrated into these community circles. And so it led me to think one step further, what if a religious tradition that is 2,500 years old could explicitly be identified as a foundation for Black Lives Matter? especially because so much of the leadership in American Buddhism is welcoming of people who self-identify as queer, transgender, non-binary. You know, there isn't this kind of pushback in the same way that many young people find in churches. So that, that was a central question. And the book Radical Dharma, which came out in 2016, was also an inspiration. My first interview is April 17th, 2017. So almost exactly a year ago, as you were noting. Uh, Reverend Angel came to Asheville and I managed to get some time with her and had this kind of, you know, unwieldy conversation with her sitting outside of Whole Foods. And there's really this question, that, like, can Buddhism really matter in this movement? You know, she had just co-written a book called Radical Dharma in response to the killings of young Black people by police officers, could Buddhism speak to that in direct ways? So she, Lama Rad, and Yasmin Sayadula, Saidula, I always mispronounce this, Yasmin Saidula, co-wrote this book and um, 
Reverend Angel brought in Zen Buddhism, Lama Rod brought in uh, Tibetan Buddhism, and Yasmin brought in her background and foundation in abolition. And together they were asking these questions as teachers and practitioners. So this book really started in that way, but as I went out and did interviews just became so much more than uh, responding to activists. Although the conclusion explicitly comes back to addressing vanguard activists very directly to say, you know, what actually does this mean for your movement? And what I conclude is that, yes, we are working to dismantle certain conditions and we are working to institute other conditions. Uh, we're working to dismantle white supremacy and we're seeking institutions like schools that really are life-giving. And in the midst of that, we are so conditioned that we have to work on our own conditioning. And that is what Buddhism provides for us, a way to deconstruct our own internalized conditioning as we seek to change external conditions. Wonderful. I mean, I think it's really powerful that in this book where you have, as you name, you know, um, interviews with 40 um, Black Buddhist teachers and long-term, long-time practitioners, and then the voices of, of another 30 plus um, through, through different teachings and writings that and I think in the very front of the book, um, you draw upon uh, Charlene Carruthers as one of the quotes in the first few pages um, from Black Youth Project 100, who was at kind of a lot of the front lines of some of that movement work then. And then the, the quote used at the introduction, at the start of the conclusion, um, is by Adrian Marie Brown. Um, uh, and so these two uh, young Black queer, um, uh, amazing uh, uh, movement organizers bringing that framing to it and, and the way that you cite. Um, so in, in that, I think I, we should come to a point of wrapping up um, uh, and um, let's take one more quote that's just come in, uh, one more question that's just come in and then I had, have, I think a, a wrap up question and uh, we'll finish. So Nancy, um, Waring says, you read a wonderful quote from your book from 7A about self, non-self. I wonder what you say when a black or brown person who is wondering about the central place of anatta in the teachings. That I would say or that these teachers would say? There, um, yes, there's so much. But um, the next quote after Sub's quote is when I sort of referred to in summary, but I'm actually going to read this out loud, Nancy, because I think this is a really um, very clear teaching. I find Lama Rod's articulation of the difference between self and non-self and also relative and ultimate reality to be very clear. So I'm just going to read this because I actually think he does a very good job in ways that I may not. But he says, in Buddhism, enlightenment isn't extinguishing, isn't the extinguishing of the self. It is the recognition of the self. It is the recognition of the illusion of self. If we did not relate to the self, to the sense of ego, then we wouldn't be able to be in relationship to people around us. Because everyone in the world communicates through ego. We relate to reality through ego. So if I were to obtain enlightenment, and I hope to at some point, but if I were to obtain enlightenment, I would still be very connected to ego, especially if I'm trying to liberate others from this reality. So it's not the ego, it's not the self that is the issue. It is our relationship to those ideas. Our relationship gives meaning to things around us. The thing itself doesn't have meaning. This basic work that I'm engaged in is this balance between self and non-self and how that relates to social liberation and how social liberation ties into ultimate liberation. And the, what I really wanna highlight in that is his distinct assertion, it's our relationship to those ideas. Our relationship gives meaning to things around us. So it's not so much that we're denying our existence or denying our humanity or denying our humanness, 
it's not that we're even engaged in a conversation about whether black people are three fifths of a human being or five fifths of it. You know, it's, it's nothing to do with that as much as it's relating to our experience and seeing with clarity how we engage. And in that, you could say observation, that capacity or that ability to look at our own experiences so directly that we become less attached. And in that capacity to detach, then there is a path to what might be called ultimate liberation so that we're not so identified with me, myself, and I, or what I possess, or you know, all of these ways that we identify ourselves. You know, I'm a professor, I'm a Black woman even. We even can step back from our racial identity, our gendered identities, our sexual identities. All, you know, this, these ways that we show up and self-identify in the world that in some ways we uh, construct or we associate with broader constructions, it's more this ability to look at how we relate to all of that. And if we can develop some spaciousness, then there is, you could say, a path to dropping into a way of being that's not so attached or so wedded, so intimately tied to these constructions. That's what Lama Rod is getting at. But it is a real practice, it, and it takes a lot of work for many of us years and years. But there is ultimate liberation in that too. And La Marad can really attest to that. All of these teachers can, I would say. Thank you for that thoughtful question, Nancy. Um, and I think let's just finish with, as we prepare for our uh, message of gratitude to you, um, um, you're already probably working on your next book project, maybe. <laughs> um, <laughs> would you like to share anything uh, with this community about what you're working on now and maybe how it's growing out of this uh, book as it, as it comes out to all of us? Well, I was working on one book. I um, have an agent <laughs> and uh, Glenda, my dear Glenda, Bows to you, Glenda, helped me to figure this out. Um, so I'm working on a trade book, but in the back of my mind, actually, there is another book that in some ways I am, have more affinity towards. I'm still actually, this is all in motion, but both of these books, one of which I think will deal with more contemporary challenges to teaching about racism in schools, you know, the uh, banning of books, the challenges to teaching about gender and sexuality, even mentioning them in the classroom, the challenges to parents of transgender children. There's one book that is, I just sent off a new introduction to my agent that is looking at uh, these contemporary, you could say sites of resistance. And I explicitly employ James Baldwin and Audre Lorde in analyzing what's really going on and then bring in, you know, just what do we do with all of the fear that's both fostering and um, you could say exploding these conversations and challenges, but also the ways in which teachers are responding and administrators are responding where they are drawing back and shutting down and self-silencing, taking books off of shelves preemptively. So, so that's one project that I think, um, is speaking in some direct ways, but with a depth of analysis using these two Black queer writers. The book that I initially started writing that I think is a more academic book is looking at Dharma teachings through Baldwin and Lord's eyes. And that's looking not only at teachings on um, what we call the three defilements or three poisons, a greed, hatred, and aversion, but also looking at the ways in which Baldwin and Lord talk about impermanence and death and the sensuality we mentioned earlier. They have um, so much, they have these beautiful writings on compassion. There's so much in their work that I think really do illuminate a range of Dharma teachings. But my academic training is to just work with primary text. And I think that might be a different book than a trade book. Um, just trying to figure it all out right now. But what is clear to me is that these two writers have given us a framework 
And I think a kind of illumination or a kind of clarity of Dharma teachings that are so um, prevalent, so accessible, uh, so enlightening to use that word very deliberately. So I, I do center their primary text, their essays in particular, and their interviews in my, um, I could say, new ventures or my two new book projects. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and thank everyone in this um, beautiful circle that has come together today. I wonder if those of you who uh, are willing to do so might want to um, take yourself onto video right now and maybe um, give a, a bow or a wave or however you want to give gratitude to um, our just um, wonderful speaker <laughs> and um, Dharma teacher today, um, Rima Vesley Flad, for this really uh, thoughtful sharing about Black Buddhists and the Black radical tradition. Thank you so much, Rima. Thank you all for being here today in this short space. Thank you also. It's been a pleasure. It's really wonderful to share this. And I just believe so much in these voices and really honor them. And if for no other reason, you should buy the book just to get access to their wisdom. It's, it's so amazing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you to so many friends and family. I uh, just feel like it's, you know, people I haven't seen for so long. It's so wonderful to see your faces. Also new friends, some, some current students, people whose names I've only known and I can now put a face with. It's really wonderful. So thank you all for coming. I appreciate you.